Welcome to this week's episode of Pensado's Plays. He's Dave Pensado. I'm Herb Charwick, and you're about to meet the coolest name in audio, Patrizio Pigliapoco. But first, remember to mark your calendars Saturday, July 21st. Dave and I are the keynote interview at Imsta Festa Chicago. 12 noon is the time. It's at the Chicago SAE campus. We're bringing a bunch of free gear. You can get your questions answered. We'll be interviewed. We want to meet you guys, meet you ladies, and do a hang. We'd recommend getting your seat by 1130. We hear the registration is doubled, and it's going to be a very good Imsta Festa. And the best news, it's free. Sign up at imstafesta.org, and you are good. We've got great gear from our friends like Warm Audio, Sonarworks, Avid, IK Multimedia, Melodyne, and Terrace, and a new company we've got our eye on called Leapwing Audio. They're getting some great reviews from some big time friends of ours. Their Dyne One uh, plug-in and Center One plug-in, we've heard some really good things about. So again, here are the details. Saturday, July 21st, Chicago SAE campus. Be in your seat by 1130. Sign up at imsta.org and we will see you there. All right, DP, what's this week's ITL? Uh, Herb, sometimes we have a need to um, convert mono to stereo with certain tracks like synths and guitars. That's called the altruistic effect, right? Uh, how'd you know that? Uh, just, I've learned. You went to Berkeley, didn't you? Uh-huh. Uh, and so here's a unique way, rather lengthy and somewhat convoluted track. From time to time, we find the need in the uh, mixing world and engineering world to convert a mono signal to a stereo one. Uh, I recently had an opportunity where I needed to, to convert this guitar signal into into stereo, the mono into stereo. And uh, I came up with a solution. I, I wanted to share it with you. It's pretty cool. By the way, this is a, a Sonny Diamonds production of a song by Jacoy, both gifted, talented people. I love the way Jacoy sings and writes. And I, I like what Sonny, what Sonny does too. I'd love to meet him sometime. Here, here's the um, clean guitar. see here I, uh, I just put a, uh, an EQ on this side and uh, on this side this is just a gain control put a little, little chorus on it and, and some EQ now I'm feeding my guitars to a bus that has a 33609 plug-in on it and I'm running it in, in multi mono and I'm also running that plug in in such a way that, that each side has different controls on it. Experiment with that because just that alone will help enhance your stereo. So this is a copy of this. These, these are two mono tracks. So I've got a little panning going on here. That doesn't sound bad, but now Let's add a little bit of a real guitar amp. Let's add a little bit of EQ. And let's add a plug-in. Now this plug-in takes this frequency and moves it to the right of the, of the spectrum. I love this company, Nugent. This plug-in, get it, just go buy it. Don't even, don't even hesitate. And now over here, I've got a um, couple of pedals uh, that I think probably add a little bit of color which gives the, gives the two sounds a distinction but what we're trying to do is trick your ear and making you think there's two different sounds and um and then here we go over here we're taking a different frequency and putting it on the other side so you see here different different frequencies and so now that alone is helping me pan it by nugent and then, and then we've got uh, um, a little spring reverb on this side. So check it out. Okay. And so, so this is just a, a filter. Nothing special. Now, are you ready for it? Here's the full effect. Watch this.
You can use this on on anything, you know. I, I I'm thinking about trying it on a vocal, a mono, you know, lead singer's part might be kind of cool. Uh, it it all hinges around this plugin, man. Good stuff. So so basically, what you do is you find a frequency you like, and then you can pan it more left, less left. You can pan it to the right, more right, and you can do some compression with it. I think it's compression. Anyway, you can do a lot of stuff with it. I love this company. We'll see you soon. Our guests, besides incredible credits with Chris Brown, Little Dicky, Prince Royce, Fergie, and more, has probably the coolest name in audio. Now, there's two ways to do this. There's the straight-ahead American way, Patrizio Pigliapoco. Then there's the Italian way, which is Patrizio Pigliapoco. <laughs> so, <laughs> welcome to the much. show. Thank did you. I do it okay? You did great. Oh, good, did good, 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 good. <laughs> you so, did great. I did pretty good, right? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So as you can tell, we've been having some fun uh, before the cameras roll. Um, but what is more fun is watching a career that's just budding and taking off and doing yeah, anything. Yeah, it's been life changing for yeah. you. Yeah, definitely. When did the ascent start? A couple years ago? I think a couple years ago I started getting in with um, Fergie and all these artists that were raising the line in the bar for me, working yeah. with them. And um, that was all in the last four years. The wow. whole beginning was just working and grinding and mm -hmm. just being, you're working with people that are famous and are celebrities, but you're not receiving mm -hmm. on the other end, getting paid, getting credited, mm -hmm. those type of things, which are really important so in your least. career because it can Fine. be everything, you know? Mm -hmm. But Chris really changed my life for sure, mm -hmm. um, getting with him and, and on from there. How, how were you found? I was found because I was dealing with Josh Goodwin a lot. Um, there was oh, a project that I was working with um, and he was mixing everything. So I was coming to the studio to record plant and I was bringing all the files to him. Mm. Um, so we developed a relationship and whatever. Great guy. Great guy. Yeah, Josh so, is the best. Brian Springer, Chris's old engineer, retired. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember I was in New York and I guess Josh had given Brian my number. So I get, I'm at a friend's house waiting to go to the airport to fly back to LA. And I get a text message from Brian, which I still have the message, but mm -hmm. the message is really long. And he's like, I heard you were a great engineer, all these things, Josh recommended you. And would you be willing to take over Chris's position? Mm -hmm. I mean, my position working for Chris. Wow. And for me, that was like, I didn't even believe it, right? Because right. you're talking about seeing something that you saw in your dreams only, you know, coming mm -hmm. up in, in the business. Um, so when he offered it to me, at first I really didn't even know what to I asked my wife, I was like, is this? Right. And she was like, do it, do it. Right. Uh -huh. So I immediately, um, I said, yes, I'll do it. And he was on tour. So I had about a month and a half to kind of get my head in the game. Mm -hmm. um, I dealt with obviously a lot of big artists in the past, but dealing with someone like Chris or even Bieber, Rihanna, all those top artists is a whole nother level. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm just schedule wise and, and just everything that happens, you know, there's a lot more inner workings. Um, but yeah. The preparation for that though, were all the things you did beforehand. Exactly, it's a lot, a lot. The, the whole experience of dealing with clients, dealing with everything per, gets you ready to be in this position. Like, um, cause working with Chris for me, there's not a lot of things that he has to tell me to do. Right. Like you wouldn't think, oh, do this, do that. He just comes in, he cuts the stuff, and then it's I contact the producers, get the files, do this, uh, do everything myself because uh, he's an A-list artist. He doesn't. He has people that do. So that's the position that you're practicing this entire time to take over, and 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 so there's a lot that goes into it. It's just not just hitting record and. and yeah, I was gonna say it's I not mean, that. It, it's not just no. technical, which is some what we try to do with the show is not just be technical, right? Because there's so much of that that takes you so far, right? But what separates you sometimes, besides your own internal gifts, right. is understanding the other stuff. Right. And that's really important when you get into the super For sure, level. even the relationships too. Um, yeah. Having the relationships with the label. I mm -hmm. know the VP there, I deal mm -hmm. with them billing yeah, and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, if we need to clear a feature for Chris, mm -hmm. I just, I don't even go, oh, Chris, do you want this and that? No, I just go to the label and they handle the rest. They'll just contact whatever yeah. needs to be done. But you. knowing that stuff is really important because no one else is gonna do it. Mm -hmm. And there's always someone ready to take over that and, and get ahead of you. So if you had to write out your job description, what would it be? And by the way, what's that T-shirt say you're wearing? Oh, you've been fucking hit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just, just clarifying. That's okay, all. Good. Sorry. Uh, so what's your job no, description? No, what, what would it read? I mean, in layman terms, it would read a recording engineer. Mm -hmm. But if you really were to take a look at everything I do, it would be. Yeah, that's why I'm interested. Yeah, in. it's it's basically 
the recording aspect, obviously. It's going and having the relationships with the producers and I get all the tracks. So when Chris writes, they don't just send his email beats, they send everything to me. And then I coordinate, I let the producers know, hey, you know, these beats are being used, we're, we've written to these beats. And so that's one part of it. And then we get to the next level where he wants to use a record. So now I have to go and contact the producers, get the files from them. And then they're gonna say, well, before we give you the files, we wanna make sure that we've spoken to the label and we have yep. contracts in order. Yep. So I round about and I go to the label. I say, look, I need to get these files to mix it, but they don't wanna send the files until, so I'm the one, I'm not even in the studio doing this. This is me at home right. doing all this you know, work on the side that has nothing to do with yeah, pressing record. You're really VP of recording. Yeah, exactly. So it's, but you have to do these things because there's so many people that want to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and there's only five or six of the top artists in the world. And so this position, there's not a lot of them. So if you're not willing to go the extra step, mm -hmm. there's 10 other people behind you that are. And you know who you're like, maybe whether you were intended to or not, because I talk to him a lot and I talk to his wife a lot. Got and it. Them advice. So somebody who does that as well too, but on a, on a, in sort of a different way is Josh. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. A lot of Josh's magic is Josh, as an engineer, has been included in the A and R process. Got you. He's got ridiculous ears. Right. And A and R people will actually get involved with him, ask opinions, right. or if he says, right. And he's very quiet about. It. I'm probably no, pulling he, him out. You and, are because I know him, and I've, I've never seen him yeah, to be that I, way. Yeah, I mean, he's taking me to dinner to talk about how to handle that. Wow. Um, because engineers specifically don't get that option. Not that their opinion isn't asked, but the the idea that you can be part of the right. handling process right. to find a hit song or to. And right. So you're. You're following I'm trying to things. get them, you know. Well, I think what you have, I think what you, and without getting all philosophical about it, I think that you're playing, there seems to be a distinction out there in my view, and you're playing in the major label game. Right. And the major label game has different rules than the indie game. For sure, 100%. And, it, and it's a very different thing. I yep. mean, everybody can argue what's better, what's not. Right. I, I come from the major label side, so I understand that a little bit better. But if you don't have the gears for that, right. you, you're only going to go so far right. in the major label game. Yeah, yeah. you're juggling lots. You're juggling a lot of things. And on top of that, I'm on call 24-7 for wow. Chris. So wow. I may be doing stuff during the day, like going to the label to turn stuff in or sign a document, whatever it may be. And I don't know, maybe at 2 in the morning that night, I'm going to get a call to work until mm -hmm. 10 in the morning. Mm -hmm. So I'm taking naps, sleep schedule. It's a whole, it, everything is constantly work for me, whether I'm in the studio or not. Absolutely. It's part of it. What was it like working on Heartbreak on a Full Moon? That's 45 songs yeah, on the album. Crazy. How many did you record? So did I you recorded, think about committing suicide during that? And no, I actually was like, this happened on purpose, basically. Basically, I've been coming to, mm -hmm. I've been working in this industry all this time, and I arrive finally to where I feel like I'm gonna have my big break, and they just throw this massive, Ooh. this massive yeah, project Let me throw a number at you. You recorded 250 songs so recorded in a year and a half. Yeah, in a year and a half. 18 mm -hmm. months. 18 months, so we'll record mm -hmm. between two, three, even up to 10 songs in a day, depending on if we're cutting records that are written or writing new records. Wow. And then we chose from those 45 songs, and then it still wasn't enough. He decided he wanted to do a deluxe, so we added a 12-song deluxe to that. How do you sequence something like that? It was very hard <laughs> to sequence because we had more than the 45 or 50. We had about 250 to go through, and then Damn. we narrowed down to 150, narrowed down to 100, still not knowing we were going to do 50. We were thinking we were going to have to narrow that down to 17. Wow. But he just figured he wasn't going to be able to do it. Right. So it was a, a toss and pull b between the label to make sure they can approve us doing 45 songs, which is four albums worth, mm. plus a deluxe is is crazy. What, 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 what the first label guys say when he first they heard thought it. we were crazy <laughs> they thought we were crazy they didn't think it was gonna work and chris was like i promise it's gonna work it's gonna work and it did it did it work, did work and, it worked great. and i remember going to the studio i had four uh whiteboards the big ones you get at target yeah, and yeah. i had the i had that thin tape the console tape Sweet. and i had made you know about mm -hmm. 20 spaces each and then there was also because there was extra extra records obviously that we were because we were mixing by the time we got down to mixing it was about 65. jason joshua mixed he had them. mixed everything yeah mm. so that was that was dealing with maddox mm -hmm. constantly on a daily basis yeah. and then luckily with chris we don't go back on stuff once we cut a record it's pretty much done so oh, there's not a lot of yeah. calling the mixer and be like hey we want to add some background vocals that'll never happen which is really great because that can get 
you're dealing with 150 tracks oh plus God. with music and everything, including vocals, uh -huh. and then you're saying, no, we want to replace this or take this out is impossible, mm -hmm. you know, it's just too much. Right. Right. Um, Privacy, that's my favorite song on the, of, of the really? 3,000 songs. And uh, I love that song. Well, give me a story about it. So we were recording Privacy in New York, and it was literally, we had landed in New York on the 28th of September. He was going to do a show, so we were going to be there for New Year's. Um, and on New Year's, I don't know if it was New Year's night or the night after, but it may have been on New Year's night. It was before New Year's struck. Mm -hmm. And I had this whole plan about, it's going to be 10 o'clock, we were going to go out and celebrate. <laughs> we were actually cutting the whole time through the, the, the sounding of the, of the ball dropping. He was in the booth. Wow. But for privacy, it was literally 15 minutes. Ooh, we pulled up yeah. the song, and he just felt a vibe. There was 35 people in the room, and we were at um, Platinum in mm -hmm. New York, mm -hmm. in the K room to the left. Mm -hmm. Are you just producing on that? So the thing was, there was a lot of arrangement that I did, and there was a lot of beat edits that I do. Um, that happens just because when these beats when they're sent to us they're pretty much a standard cut it's and a, when you're dealing with singers and R&B yeah but even the arrangement is, mm -hmm. is just like verse hook verse hook verse hook and there's a lot more that goes into it when you're dealing with a singing record or R&B record mm -hmm. um, but he recorded that record in 15 minutes he wrote the whole thing there's not a lot of backgrounds I think there's two or three backgrounds in there wow. but the whole thing was just it was just a vibe he just wow. did line for line the whole way and we didn't think anything of it either it was just like another record we had done, and that's it. Mm -hmm. But everyone kept telling him, this is it. T tell me the truth. I, I, I was sure that, that Chris was going back into the vault and, and dragging out some old songs, like 30 of them, and then putting 15 new ones. Oh, all no. these songs were brand all new, brand cut new. from scratch. I cut all of them. Yeah. Mm. There was, that's there incredible. was one that had uh, dripped over from uh, Brian, but because Jason Hardy mixed it, so... Chris wanted to add it, and he was like, it's perfect. Jason already mixed it last year because it was supposed to be for the, the previous album. Mm -hmm. So that was one record that was completely done. But The rest, brand new. Are you a musician? So I started out being a musician when I was 10 mm -hmm. as a bass player, but I kind of left that and went towards the engineering. I definitely have an ear for just mm -hmm. play, and then is that good or not, you know, mm -hmm. or whatever. But I stopped playing recently yeah but you don't necessarily lose what's in your head you don't lose what's in your head that's and that the thing. allows you to exactly. communicate and integrate with always with artists. yeah and, definitely and somebody like chris who has your own call you all being able to speak in musicality yeah actually we don't really speak in the booth anymore he really? we kind of have like this, this he rhythm. knows like because there's certain references like there's this thing he says yeah but yeah doesn't mean keep it it means do it again uh -huh. so when i hear that i automatically know just to do it again so there's these small little things. If there's ever an issue, obviously I'll come and let talk back. But we don't really talk that much when it comes to like the cutting. Outside, obviously, there's a lot of conversation. But mm -hmm. when he's in the booth, it's pretty straightforward. Um, little Dicky. Little Dicky. How about that? that talk was, about it. That was crazy. So um, I got a call to go to Chalice, to the recording studio Chalice. And um, they told me Little Dicky was going to come in. And I had literally no idea because I'm thinking this is a comedy the Weird Al Jankovic type mm -hmm. of person mm -hmm. and we were dealing with a big R&B singer so how could mm -hmm. so he brought the song in and the song was done completely Dickie had his parts and we had a they had a demo singer um, writer named Vito who mm -hmm. had done all the parts for Chris and he brought the song and he's like Vito? I want to do this huh did you say Vito Vito no, v Vito. E yeah okay. Vito so he's like I want you to do this record this is my idea and you know, when you try to explain the video, it's not that easy to explain if you've never seen it. Right. Yeah. So he starts to explain, have you seen this movie, Freaky Friday? This is a song, he plays it for us. Obviously, when you hear it, it's a lot, it's even harder because you're hearing in, in the video, they're going back and forth. Sure. But so we actually got it and we kind of understood it. And Chris was hyped about it. Like once we got it, everyone was hyped. And he described the whole video. We cut the record in 20 minutes. Damn. Um, it was written. So it was literally just a just line clear. by line, just yeah. go through backgrounds, ad libs at the end mm -hmm. and that's it and then mm -hmm. but dicky couldn't believe it because he's like he comes from he records in his bedroom so he's in chalice and he's watching us record record he's like it took me like a day to record that right right the, the, the whole song and you guys just did it in 20 minutes but that's just the way chris moves like mm -hmm. i have to just catch up with him because he he's has a one take he's a one take. I, love, I love that video yeah everybody and it was calling me did you see that video did it's hilarious video? i mean we were in the store we were in a store with my wife one time and this girl that worked there went by nah, no freak <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. Back in my days, I worked with a pretty good R&B singer. And um, when they're on, it's fast. Yeah. 
you know, like they hit it, they have pitch, they understand, but right. they also understand their mistakes. Yes. So they come back and they target those right yep. away. And you tend to, the guy I used to work with, we would get a fully done demo or two yeah. a day. And oftentimes from there to a record was not very far. Yep. Is, that, is that the experience with Chris? With Chris, I think he definitely, it's not far off, but there's definitely no comparison. You yeah. can't compare the demo to what he gives you, just his voice. Obviously, it's it's been stamped in everyone's head for so long, but yeah. he definitely takes it to the next level. There's a lot of sometimes word changes he does to fit more with him. Obviously, mm. ad-libs, stuff that fits more of his voice uh -huh. and what he would do as Chris Brown. Mm -hmm. um, but they're definitely not far off. A lot of the records, especially when they're writers that we work with yeah. constantly that already kind of know the flow and how it is. Absolutely. Most of the time we get records that are one verse, hook, and then empty second verse, which so is can so that. you can write the second uh, verse, yeah. Uh, what uh, uh, What is your mic chain for him, vocal chain? So vocal chain is going to be Telefunken 251, uh -huh. uh, 1073, uh -huh. CO1B, uh -huh. and then directly into Pro Tools, no console. And, and do you record the... The EQ and the compressor, or do you just record? There's no EQ on the way in. Okay. Um, I just have the low pass or the high pass on the microphone. Yeah. Um, do and you record then, the compressor? The compressor? What do you mean to record it? I record it. It's in the chain. Yeah. Yeah, 1073, okay. CO1B, and then okay. directly into Pro Tools. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. And um, that's the chain. And then once it hits Pro Tools, it's pretty much, there's not a lot going on in there either. Um, it's pretty simple inside the session. He prints autotune. Um, and that's always between zero on auto tune and fifteen. Mm. Just depends on the vibe. If we're doing oh, something so more rap, he, he prints auto tune, and it's it's a once it's done, it's done. It's done. There's Gee, never any. Wins. Oh, I don't like how the the way he hears it back, and he says next. And then when he says next take, mm -hmm. that take before is is done. What do you monitor? So I monitor on tens, on NS tens, but there's a lot of times when there's. 50 people in the room sometimes and it gets like very cans. loud mm -hmm. so i use cans i use um the sony 7250s mm -hmm. 7520s mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sony and, 7520s. and are you working out at your studio or? no he has a studio in his house oh, okay gotcha yeah gotcha. he keeps everything like that we used to use paramount and record plant mm -hmm. and different places but it's just hard last minute like i said i'm, I'm on call 24 7 so right. sometimes he'll call and be like oh let's get a studio and i'm like it's 10 o'clock right. paramount doesn't have any rooms available but right. 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 so we had to just yeah. get our own room now got it so now it's good and you work you work strictly in pro, in pro tools strictly in pro tools got it yeah got it got it got it got it definitely and do you have room inside your relationship with Chris to do other artists when you have time? Yes, when I have time, he definitely encourages me to okay. do things outside. It, it makes you sharper. It, it makes you better. sharper. It also mm -hmm. helps get out of the comfort zone. Because yeah. when I'm with him, I'm in my comfort zone. You know, right. me and him never have any issues. I mean, we've developed a relationship and everything's smooth sailing. But right. I get in the room with other people to kind of, you know, and I find myself doing I find myself sticking a lot to how we cut, and when uh -huh. I work with someone else who, like for example, Chris is never gonna cut two lines at once. He's always gonna stop after the first line. Uh, so I find myself recording someone else, and right after they do the line, I stop them, and they yeah, want like, it to go to the second describe line. Describe that, that's interesting. So he goes line by line. One line by line. Um, he he basically cuts the first line, and, and that's it. He just cuts line by line. So when I work with other people, sometimes they'll do three lines at a time or four lines. You're or like, one no, no. Do and I immediately, <laughs> boom, record back to the to the top. And I'm like, shit, oh, right, sorry. Right, right. <laughs> I won't do it again. <laughs> but because I'm so used to it with him, so I have to kind of get out of my programmed knowledge. Is there any part of the process where he relies on you for, for inspiration or for encouragement? Or is it just always silence? No, I think that when we find a beat or a record, we'll kind of look at each other to be like, Oh, yeah. Mm. Or we'll be like, mm, it's okay. You know what I mean? And mm. we'll kind of reference off of each other. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, he'll definitely let me um, give my opinion. Oh, no, do it again. Because I like to push him. Oh, okay. And he likes to, obviously, he likes to be pushed. And he does it with live shows, too. Mm -hmm. um, but he likes to be pushed by the person, his live sound guy or me, mm -hmm. to get the takes better. No, that was that was 90. We can get 100. Mm -hmm. Even though it was a great take, sure. it's just about pushing them to that next level and getting mm -hmm. them to, to great, you know, even if the take, maybe the take was bad, but you'd say, oh, that, that was a good take, but we can get it better. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that's just a general philosophy that I use mm -hmm. um, for cutting. And and uh, uh, this is this is a sincere question. Um, his patience is, is good in the studio? His patience is good with me, okay. um, but he, like all of us, I have zero patience as well. Mm -hmm. um, my main loss of patience is worrying that he's going to lose his patience. So, for example, when we were at Paramount <laughs> yeah. and something would go wrong, mm -hmm. 
and the, the assistant, for example, did something wrong, I'm looking at the assistant like, Chris is not going to come out here and cuss you out because he doesn't right. know your name. He's going right. to look at me like, what are you doing? So Get your I'm guy in life. Exactly. <laughs> so for me, my patience is based on his patience. Got it. So I like to make sure that he's got a buffer, mm -hmm. right? And then I'm taking, I'm making sure and skiing and getting through and making sure everything's right. But see, that's part of that other stuff. That, that you have to do you, exactly. That makes you really special in that one percent. For sure. 1%. For um, sure. And it and it and it's not just service. I mean, I think people think sometimes it's just I will just be available to do what somebody else wants. This is about creating an environment so right. that the best can happen. Right. And, and taking whatever. initiative to do that. Yeah. Because... And it becomes really critical. Right. That's the way I feel about our team. I mean, if they don't care, right. It doesn't matter how much I care. Right, you exactly. Know what I mean? Or if or if I don't care, I need somebody to tell me you're acting like you don't care. Right. You know what I mean? So it brings you back up. Definitely. It's, it's a it's a synergy. How does um uh, your beautiful wife is here in the room. Yes. And so when you're on call twenty four seven and you make decisions on where you're gonna live based on your work and so, yes. so forth, that takes into account a relationship. Yes. And you know, we have threatened to do a relationship show literally for the last three years. We just haven't pulled it off. So we might ask <laughs> Both you guys come back because yeah. I think that's more important than people think. If you don't have somebody yeah, who gosh. understands, definitely, and is and and can be supportive and understanding, that sometimes you have to be in creative head, right, as opposed to non-creative head. Talk about talk about that and how that's important. She literally saves my life, basically, mm -hmm. because for me, I've never had to work at the level I'm working at now and not have somebody just mm -hmm. because we've been for five years now. We've been together, so she's been along for the ride mm -hmm. coming up to where I'm at now. Mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely really difficult with her because I she likes to say, you know, do, do, do it. It's fine. But I feel bad, obviously, as a person because I'm getting up. You know, we've left dinner. We've been at a restaurant and I've gotten the call and literally had to say, can I get the check now? We mm. got to go. And, and she completely understands. And she's like, no, don't worry, don't worry. Is that before dessert? Oh, yeah. This oh, okay. is like we yeah. sat down and we ordered something damn. and then we asked for the check and whatever was there, I either leave you it or let's get, get to, to go. Deep, no, no, no. Man, damn. And I order food That's when I get to the house. It's just that much more important. Even though if I could, I would say, you know, Chris, I'm, I'm at dinner with my, oh, fine. Mm -hmm. But one day I may have an emergency and I may have to use that card. So mm -hmm. for now, we're just going to... Let oh, it slide. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. smart. Yeah. That's real smart. Yeah. yeah, and 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 critical. I don't think people understand. And in this environment, it can work the other way too. Sometimes the 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 wife or the girlfriend is the creative person, right? And the guy's got to be supportive, right? And it you know it can go, it can go either way. Definitely. Your dreams. Where do you want to go with it? So, recording is amazing and so much fun, and it's always a party. But. For me, I think I'm starting to get to the age. I'm about to be 30 in a couple of years. Oh and God, just, just, I just want to be at 40, just re like relaxing and working maybe as a consultant for a big label. Mm -hmm. Still being in the studio, obviously I have all the relationships with all the owners and managers and keeping that intact. But mm -hmm. I like consulting and kind of being off to the side and, mm -hmm. and kind of just relaxing. It's a big part of my career. I, I can... Yeah. It's... We can talk I about I want to put all the hard work in now and all the time because, mm -hmm. I mean, I've done... 22 hour sessions with Chris sometimes and those get crazy so I don't want to have to do that forever you know I want to put my six hours in per day and then get it going. Do, do you recognize um, I mean we're we're acutely sensitive to that at this table and we think that the audience should be aware of this too that sometimes when you're in that mode it's also easy to forget about your health. Oh yeah. You know, oh yeah. Because you just get in this rhythm and yeah food is delivered and you're not and you really feel healthy moving. you feel like yeah. you're moving yeah. but it's then you it's, get up and fall over and yeah and i'm happened. sitting in a chair all day yeah yeah um that's why you saw me walking around i don't ever sit down because i have to sit so much in the mm. studio so mm. i actually pace most that's of the day that. yeah. smart. i'm a pacer oh that's really smart yeah. that's really smart does a show like this is education something that you think is important to an audience to me it's pretty much the most important thing to them because for me, I never had this show. I mean, I had this mm -hmm. show, but not in the very beginning. You know, when did you guys start? How long ago, maybe? 1964, I think. No, 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 no I'm no. talking about the show. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, it's 2011. 11. So yeah. in 2011, I was already working for 3-6 Mafia, but I would have loved to have this show at the stage where I was at in 2007, 2008, 2009, mm -hmm. where I was in school. Um, but it's pretty much everything because I would have loved to have the inspiration and, and the knowledge from somebody who's reachable. That's somebody that's not too that's famous and this and that. Mm -hmm. Somebody that's relatable to you, mm -hmm. and to have them be able to basically spit knowledge or give you the knowledge 
that you need to, to mm -hmm. keep going is really important. I would love to keep doing like speaking schools, mm. even cutting classes. Like I would love to just do like simple cutting classes where, because mm. cutting is, is really simple once you do it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, templates, stuff like that is like super If you're interested, I know a couple places I would love that, to do stuff, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. would be interested in yeah. having you come speak. Um, and we'd have a pretty aggressive live event schedule where we go around like you heard us talking about going to Chicago yeah. and doing some stuff um, and a lot of times we like to either bring gear or bring people cool um, because people don't get a chance to meet you for sure you know and and candidly you can bring the legacy guys and they have a place that's important mm -hmm. but there's a whole lot of passionate people that want to meet the guy who does Chris Brown of course yeah yeah you know they, and they, I'm, they I love us. Just being able to speak about that stuff to them. Is Chris supportive of your career? Chris is very supportive, and that, I'm fantastic. really lucky about that because he he always wants me to go out and get the next thing and get your money and do your thing. Right. Even with because I receive publishing on a lot of the records. So on the Ooh. album, I have um, 17 placements across the whole album. Nice. Um, and that just comes from us doing things, arrangement, and then the producers obviously saying, "Hey, you know, you deserve this." Da -da -da Much respect stuff. to the producers and Chris Brown. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. So everyone, it's a teamwork thing. Get, oh, no, most fine. artists don't care. They no. couldn't care less. They it, know you're getting your day rate, and that's and that's, and that's it. it. But there's so much more that goes into it. And yeah. as engineers, a lot of times we we just let that go because what are you going to do? Fight the guy? Then you're right. not going to have a job. So, if if by some magic way, yes, um, if Chris were to come up on a videotape now, what would he say about you? Um, <laughs> he would probably say a lot of things that would embarrass me. Yeah, that'd be yeah. great. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. definitely. We, we should maybe... He, make my, why, he does it to my wife. He tells her a lot of things and then I shy away. We should... We, we should get Chris. He's on tour right now, but we'll get him. Uh, I'll tell you how we can do that with him on gotcha. tour. Gotcha. So, well, I gotta tell you, it is, um, you gotta play this batter's box game. Okay. Um, are you ready? Oh, you know it. Um, there yeah, are yeah, a legacy yeah. of great Italian baseball players throughout Major League Baseball. Really? Yeah, there are. And um, we'll talk about it another time because I can only pull off authentically one Italian name at a time. Got it. And that will be mine. Yes. Patrizio Piccolo. <laughs> See, I kind of got that down. Your wife is giving me approval off of yeah. camera. She's, is she she's shaking her head. No, she's actually Spanish and Hungarian. Oh, wow. Wow, so wow. he's Chongor's Hungarian, Chongor's too, Hungarian. you guys. And they just did a Hungarian point, which you guys can't see on camera, but they both went. Like, <laughs> it was kind of cool. All right, so batter's, batter's box. box. Have batter fun up. with it, Dave. Pitch. Kick. Kick. Um, I'm going to go with McDSP G Console Compact. Ooh. Oh, he's showing off. He's software, dude. Yeah, bass. Bass, I'm going to go with UADVOG. Mm. Preamp. Preamp. 1073, but I'll give you one more. I'll give you the Shadow Hills, the 500 series that I like. Oh, cool. Reverb. Reverb, I'm going to go with the Valhalla. I love the Valhalla stuff. Yeah, me too. Uh, Pop screens. Pop screens, um, everything, it, it, distance, Okay. buffer. I like that. I like that. EQ. EQ, Fab Filter, Pro Q, but I'll give you one more, GML. Okay. Compressor. Compressor, uh, the UAD Silverface 1176, and... LN? No, the is it the SE or the LN? The LN is a blackface, no? I thought the LA was a... We'll find out. We'll find know. out later. Yeah. I'll look it up. Okay, uh, delays. Delays, I'm going to go with H delay. Oh, no. 808. 808. Uh, Let's go with, have you heard of the MV2? Yeah. The Waves MV2? Awesome. I really like that. If you like that, try the Max Volume. It's the Max the, Volume. It's the MV2 on steroids. Okay, cool. What's the cheapest piece of gear you used on a Chris Brown record? Cheapest piece of gear. Oh, uh, use the D-verb for reverse reverbs. <laughs> Simple. D-verb. That's always the easiest to do. D-verb the that. bad reverb. Oh, yeah. Do you ever, speaking of how you answer Batters Box stuff, do you ever have to deal with live instrumentation? I don't usually. I, I've cut horns twice maybe in my mm -hmm. life, guitars maybe 10 times. Mm -hmm. um, bass, I have a, lot, a little bit more. Sure. Drums, I've cut maybe once in my life. I mm -hmm. don't really like pinpoint in that mm -hmm. stuff just because mm -hmm. for me, there's not a lot of of work in that realm for mm -hmm. me, mm -hmm. you know, with mm -hmm. Chris. Mm -hmm. um, but I can definitely 
give it a shot. Gotcha. <laughs> well, it wasn't it wasn't a moral. I'll call, I'll call was, Dave and, and ask him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, well, listen. I get to make a record. I mean, I get to you, sing and play. And you all get to that? sing and play. Oh yeah, sure. Well, maybe you want to just we'll do have a discussion about that. <laughs> play maybe. We'll maybe. give them the wrong so, direction. So. Um, I can rap. The uh, it is fun to, um, and I think important for our audience to understand that you're never too young to start thinking about your direction and where you want to go. Definitely. And the application that you want to make, and and what you what you want to do and what you don't. What you're not willing to do, right? That's that's important too. And yeah. you, what's what's fun is you have such a firm grasp on where you're going, along with your work, yeah, holding up, which is really cool, which is a testament to, to who you are and how you've been raised and what's going on, man. Congratulations! Yeah. Thank you so much for everything. Um, so glad that you joined us. Yes. And uh, don't make it your last time. No, it's been an honor to be here with we you guys. We got some we got some more stuff to talk to you about. So, DP, take us home. You know what? I'm sitting here uh, with Patricio thinking about. Um, our profession and how it's changed. We're we're in a we're in a service industry. We're no different than say a waiter or a barber, stuff like that. And in, in this town, skill is a given. Everybody here is gifted as an engineer. But what separates and what helps people like Patricio start their career is the willingness to do all the little peripheral things, like manage the studio, uh, always being on call, doing business dealing with the labels, transferring files, dealing with all these people. And he's not going to be doing that the rest of his life, but it's a, it's a way to, to, to show value to a customer that you can build on. And so don't forget to do all the little things because that's what's going to really help your success. Like I said, there's a lot more successful, a lot more talented engineers in this town than I am. But I always made my career about service, and I think that's the, the lesson here today is how, how important service is as an adjunct to your skill set. Think about it. We'll see you next week.